Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice, brought to you by Taylor and Francis. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice. For this series on the evolution of institutional repositories, I'm joined by Judy Luther, president of Informed Strategies, Stephanie Davis Call, scholarly communications librarian and professor at Illinois Wesleyan University, and Dylan Burns, digital scholarship librarian at Utah State University. In this first episode of our four-part series, Judy and I talk about many of the ways institutional repositories are changing how libraries are recognizing new opportunities to leverage these collections in unique ways. We also discuss some of the key takeaways from the recent survey and white paper that Judy and Choice collaborated on. All right, so give us a sense of some of the ways institutional repositories are evolving. Uh, What role did they traditionally serve and what are some of the new ways institutions are using them? What's influencing these new uses and how important or challenging is it for libraries uh, or institutions to clearly define what their institutional repositories role should be? Bill, thank you for that question. Uh, if library institutional repositories aren't really all that old. And when they launched, there were two potential visions for them. One offered by Cliff Lynch, that it would be a collection of digital files. This is in the early 2000s when more content was being created in digital form. And he felt that that would repositories would serve the role of being able to um, collect that content on campus. Uh, collect in the sense that faculty would have a place to put files that might be lost on their own computers. The other view was actually inspired by Spark, which saw it as a way to push back on the commercial scholarly publishers um, by offering uh, a place for faculty to self-deposit their articles. Now, the challenge with that is the whole idea of of depositing didn't really fit into the researcher's workflow. Hmm. So libraries through the years have had a lot of problem uh, getting the articles from the faculty to put in the repository because by the time they're published at the end of the embargo, when they're able to be deposited, um, the researcher has gone on to other activities, other new forms of research. And uh, the question is, well, which version of the article can be deposited? Is it the author's accepted manuscript? Um, Is it the published version of the article? Um, after it's been copy edited and laid out and formed into a a PDF. So as libraries' roles have been evolving, um, the institutional repositories themselves have been evolving. And over time, people um, have become very creative and uh, about what some of the opportunities are uh, to collect the content that's available. So what are what are some of the ways, um, you know, the, in terms of the evolution of the library, you know, how are they evolving in ways that were um, identifying those opportunities or uncovering those opportunities for new ways to use the, the institutional repository? Well, I think Lorcan Dempsey has identified a very interesting framework for thinking about this with his concept of the outside in and inside out library. Right. The outside in is the commercially available content that libraries have created ever since they were (laughs) thinking back 100 years in this country. um, Public libraries, academic libraries uh, were housing what was commercially published Mm -hmm. and available in print. Now, in the digital environment, the doors open is for other types of content. Um, And that means the on-campus created content, which increasingly everything is available in digital form. And if it's not, it can be captured in digital Mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. If it's a performance on campus, if it's uh, an exhibit, anything that is temporal in nature or an event can be um, documented in digital form Mm -hmm. and therefore um, saved as part of a collection. So I think it... um, it's a big opportunity for institutions to think about what's available and what's unique locally. Right. And then just going back to that internal external um, um, dynamic, could you think of it, the sort, especially the external sort of idea that um, it's not just the commercially produced content, but 
libraries are now thinking of their repositories as, as sort of promotional um, platforms to promote uh, the content of the what what you described as sort of the internal sort of uh, um, depositing of materials, um, whether it's it's sort of the the local research or student research or faculty research, um, but giving that sort of an external sort of outward facing uh, aspect to it as well. Is that, that, is that making that, sense? That certainly is a yeah. strongly emerging thread mm -hmm. in all of this because mm -hmm. we're starting to look at not just what's being created, but who's creating it. Mm -hmm. And as we shift from the create from what's been created, <laughs> the digital work to yeah. the creator of that work, the researcher, the student, the whole conversation shifts to a much broader range of content and really requires that uh, or prompting people to think in new ways about their institution and what the repository is an opportunity or as an opportunity to represent the institution to, I say, a much larger audience, actually right. a global um, world of academics, researchers, potential um, employers, mm -hmm. um, donors, mm -hmm. alumni. Mm -hmm. um, it grows exponentially, and libraries have not previously had a PR role in that sense. Right. Their focus has really been internal. So to shift their focus to an external role is new for them and probably new for the administration, both in the library and on campus. Right. When it comes to uh, budgeting, um, measuring success, all these elements. After listening to the needs of the librarian community, Taylor and Francis is happy to announce the recent launch of a single destination platform for their digital products, Taylor and Francis eBooks. Featuring over 90,000 titles of award-winning academic content written by a global network of editors and authors, Taylor and Francis is eager to spread the word, offering key subjects such as science, technology, engineering, medicine, humanities, and social science. Taylor and Francis eBooks puts a world of knowledge at your fingertips. Experience increased functionality, an intuitive dashboard, and gain quick access to the key information you need to make managing your collections as easy as possible. You can also explore their open access ebooks in business, science, social science, psychology, and much more. To request a free trial of any of their collections and to try out the new platform for yourself, visit www.taylorfrancis.com. That's taylorfrancis, all one word, dot com. What about the idea that, that repositories are, are not, as we kind of alluding to earlier, not simply a place to deposit materials, but a, an opportunity for curation um, mm -hmm. and, and why this opportunity tends to be, you know, make repositories more, more successfully engaged with, um, you know, there's that element of sustainability here, but, it, um, you know, that, that can also be challenging to think about um, repositories in that respect. You know, why, why is that? What's going on there? Well, the library's role on campus as the content has gone digital um, has really been changing. They've uh, Libraries have been criticized because half their book collections have not been checked out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and after all, the content's free on the web. Why do we need to <laughs> even budget for it? So this yeah. is an ongoing conversation. And as higher ed is under various economic pressures um, and challenged um, – and the last decade with students having loans that they couldn't pay off. The whole concept of a higher education degree is, um, is being reconsidered. And the importance of being able to graduate in four years, the importance of being able to have um, a job mm -hmm. uh, to pay for student loans is increasingly important. So that then raises um, conversation, points to conversations where there are really opportunities for the library to begin to think about other ways that they can play a role in um, meeting the needs and the goals of the, of the parent institution. You know, it used to be all about, well, we have content and that's what we're here for. And I think that whole conversation has been expanding. Do you think that's... Um some of those challenges came came out of 
the recessionary period we were in um, eight years ago, 10 years ago, or is that sort of a byproduct of that in terms of the challenges broader, you know, in a broader sense um, in the academy or in higher education in general, financial and otherwise, or... Um, I think, it's, I think it's a combination of factors. Yeah. I would also say digitization of content. Now we mm -hmm. have an opportunity to capture literally everything in digital form. Do we need to? Do we want to? And then and on top of that, it's not just about the institution. Our world in print was far more focused locally. Mm -hmm. And between a global business environment in the last couple of decades and a, certainly a digital global environment, uh, it's just changed the nature of the conversation altogether. Mm -hmm. Researchers are working in teams, and the teams are, are based over content, over continents. Um, you look at Atri, I also work in scholarly publishing. You, you, you look at the attributes or, or the, uh, the attribution. They are even talking about attribution as opposed to authorship. And right. you look at the people who've contributed to content. Um, the last meeting I was at last week, <laughs> two of the student, uh, the researchers who stood up, their last slide with the people they collaborated with, and there were 20 to 30 p names on that slide. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them weren't at the home institution. Mm -hmm. So we are, the, the network is doing the job of networking, enabling us to network with each other. And right. really is connecting us across institutions, across countries, across continents in ways. And I think all of that's being reflected in how we're thinking about the use of libraries, how we're thinking about research, how we're thinking about potential jobs, languages we need to speak. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So it's, so it, it's, it's less of the, the repository then, I guess, is becoming less of a place just to put everything, but you know, there are, and, and turning more into something where, hey, we can we can make an effort to be a lot more curatorial in terms of how we're approaching uh, the depositing of materials and which ones go in and um, how we present those and who gets to see them and that kind of thing. So there's that extra layer of, of extra care, I guess, that uh, in deciding what goes in and how to organize that. Right, and we're also speaking about the repository, and one of the confounding factors when I first started working on the white paper was, well, what do we mean by repository? Yeah. You know, Content TN started for archives, on special collections on campus, um, video collections could be different, data management could be different. So the only common factor in the IR, literally, was the idea of faculty papers initially. Right. Mm -hmm. It started very small, and cons the only consistent thread seemed to be that. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. Art Store, and it's about images. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so you look at every different type of digital file we have, and there probably could be a different repository platform for it. So right. one of the challenges in institutions is how do you manage those, and that really opens the door for libraries, both in terms of challenging the skills of librarians <laughs> to manage all these different file types, but also to organize them and have um, and use the right supporting um, platform that enables the user to have the functionality they need and still um, provides for discovery and and coherence in in a collection for the. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you mentioned the white paper, Judy, and, and um, you know, I wanted to get touch base on that a little bit. I mean, based on the survey and the white paper that you did do with Choice um, uh, about institutional repositories, can you talk about um, the systems and software that are being used um, to support uh, institutional repositories and the distinctions between large and small institutions um, and, and what might explain those differences? So in broad brushstrokes, large institutions, large research institutions in particular, have a different capacity and a different set of requirements. Mm -hmm. They have both um, the staff to be involved and the requirements for customization that um, underpin the conversations that they're going to have with the software developers about what they need and how they need to have it delivered. Right. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a much larger number of smaller institutions who all have unique elements um, 
a unique collections or unique content that they'd like to be able to capture, but they really need a service-based model, um, otherwise known as SaaS or software as a service that is hosted in the cloud and supported. I spoke to small institutions who had were lucky to have 10% 25% of a staff member, and they relied upon the organization providing the service to get up their web page to help mm -hmm. them um, with the uh, discovery of the content, and they had no time or, or capacity really for contributing to its development. They, okay. needed, they just needed something that worked, mm -hmm. and they were able to make good use of the service. Okay, so then they're... they're able to be almost as robust or maybe not as customizable, obviously, but in terms of really what they want to do, the, the, um, the cloud-based services are, are, are sort of delivering what, what they need. I, certainly in general, enabling yeah. to do things that they hadn't even thought about doing. Right. Okay. Excellent. And then I'm wondering, you know, just going back to the, the survey and the white paper a little bit, um, you know, how respondents indicated, you know, what was important for them in terms of measuring what they thought were success metrics for, for the repositories. Um, you know, what, what were they considering to be the important metrics to track? Mm -hmm. There were four that they mentioned, um, but I think when it turns comes to, to success, um, if we think about quantitative as the metric side, they're also the qualitative. Right. So the quantitative was um, pretty much growth over time. How large had it had their repository grown? Mm -hmm. um, they were interested in the number of downloads. That's clear cut usage. They if they got, had different usage data from a platform that they were using, then global distribution of the content and other uh, metrics available to them other than simple numbers of downloads was were of interest. And they also would count uploads, potentially uploads in a year, mm -hmm. um, actual participation by um, people on campus. But I think what struck me and, and for me was actually more powerful were the anecdotes that people told, told or spoke to about their, not only their success, but the success of the people using the content or using their content or using other content in the repository. Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that um, can be used not only to illustrate the power of a local repository, but also I think in budget meetings will be far more memorable with the administration um, than a data point. Right. Because the usage doesn't really support, at the end of the day, the goals of the university don't in any way tie into usage metrics within a library. That's the library's indication of their own performance. Right. And what's increasingly important to libraries, I think, as their roles evolve, is how they contribute to the mission, and, and not just mission, but the specific objectives of the university. That was Judy Luther, president of Inform Strategies. This concludes the first of our four-part series on the evolution of institutional repositories. This episode was brought to you by Taylor and Francis. Be sure to join us for the next episode, where I'm joined by Stephanie Davis Call, scholarly communications librarian and professor at Illinois Wesleyan University, and Dylan Burns, digital scholarship librarian at Utah State University, where we'll discuss the incipient IR. We'll hear IR origination stories from Dylan and Stephanie, and learn about the growth spurts the repositories went through. And as a small private liberal arts institution, that's really the core of who we are. We're very focused on teaching, very focused on mentorship, and undergraduate research has a long tradition here at IWU. Find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. To download the white paper that Judy Luther and Choice published, click on the same librarianship drop-down and select White Papers. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.